In this uh, ten-minute art space, our last one on ancient Rome, we're going to look at sarcophagi because there's such a great collection of them up at the altars. Um, Romans had originally practiced cremation, uh, just like their Etruscan forefathers. And we looked at this Etruscan work to the left, the Cerebitari sarcophagus. We talked about the fact that it held the ashes of the deceased in Etruscan practice. The Romans maintained this in the early part of their history and into the early Roman Empire as well. In the mid-2nd century A.D., uh, the Romans began to practice burial of the complete body, not cremation anymore. And this inspired wealthier Romans to commemorate, or excuse me, to commission, uh, elaborately carved sarcophagi uh, for their bodies to be interred in. And as we look at sarcophagi, the plural for sarcophagus, in ancient Rome, in the Roman Empire, uh, the decorations of these took on many different forms and different kinds of decorations. So here we see uh, griffins, uh, panthers with wings that are flanking a vase. This certainly shows uh, some lingering influence of Mesopotamian art that had come in already in the Etruscan period, and the Romans continued to be interested in, not as much as Greek art, but uh, certainly uh, it, it doesn't go away. Um, also notice, when we talk about the influence of Mesopotamian art, that up above on the lid, uh, we have these little Eros figures, these little Puti, uh, Cupid figures, and each one of them is... Uh, riding uh, uh, one of these hybrid winged animals. But they're no longer griffins. They're sort of sea creatures with land animal heads. Uh, and so we see here uh, a pretty... Uh, so here, uh, a horse here with a serpent body. I'm not quite sure what this is. Perhaps a wolf. Uh, and then a goat here. Uh, this is now from the right-hand side. And from the left, moving in the opposite direction... Uh, we have um, a bull, uh, here's another leopard, and here's a lion as well. Uh, again, Roman interest in, in, in realistic detail insofar as the heads at least are concerned, and vibrancy as well. The motif on the lower part where we see the griffins around the, the vase uh, seems also to echo back to uh, motifs that we saw in the Etruscan tombs. The tomb of the lion shows two symmetrical uh, leopards, that is, uh, around a plant, and that has been sort of transferred here into our, our, our panther griffins. These panthers, um, associate the creatures with, uh, Bacchus, the Roman version of Dionysus, and then the vase is intended to be a wine vase. Now, the reason that these are on a sarcophagus is that Bacchus is closely associated with the theme of rebirth or resurrection. And we'll explain that in a bit. But this makes uh, these references to, to Bacchus entirely appropriate for a sarcophagus. And so there they are again. The, this second sarcophagus up at the Walters is, shows us why Bacchus was associated with the theme of rebirth. Um, you might remember the story of Bacchus and Ariadne from when we looked at the Minotaur at uh, the Palace of Knossos. Um, from that myth, Theseus uh, was aided by Ariadne as he defeated the Minotaur. She gave him the string to find his way back out of the maze. And he took her with him on his way back to Athens, but then abandoned her for dead. Uh, at, at sea, and she washes up on the shores of the island of Naxos, nearly dead. So this is Ariadne here on the right, and uh, she's leaning back, uh, very nearly, uh, nearly dead. There are waves beneath her feet uh, here, and other signs that she is she's washed up on shore. Notice her pose, um, her legs akimbo, her arms strung out, her other arm over her head. This is the standard pose for the sleeping Ariadne, and it's a pose that we saw emulated in the image of uh, the Barberini Fawn 
because both Ariadne and the fawn, the satyr, are associated with Dionysus, and her near death becomes the model for his drunken sleep. In our sarcophagus, she is being supported by the Roman god of death, whose name is more the basis of our mortality. Uh, and he's holding her to indicate to us that she has nearly died in the experience. But in the center stands Bacchus, just here, uh, the god of wine. Uh, and actually here, to the immediate left of that, his head's missing uh, there, and he's leaning on the shoulder of one of his drunken savior chums, and he's come to rescue Ariadne from death, and he's surrounded by nothing but his debauched friends. So the idea that, uh, that Bacchus rescues Ariadne is the basis for his association with the theme of rebirth. And like I said, he's surrounded by all of these uh, uh, drunken friends from Satyrs and Putti and his uh, early teacher Silenus here, uh, young Maenads there. Um, when Ariadne finally awakens from her near-death experience, she's going to end up joining this group and celebrating for the rest of her life. She'll marry him. And this is the basis of his association with rebirth. Uh, the one is quite a few Bacchus sarcophagi. Um, in this case, it shows the birth of Bacchus. Uh, the newborn Bacchus is here on the left, and he's being nursed uh, by a wet nurse, a nymph. Uh, there's a close-up, and we see baby Bacchus here from the back. Uh, the wet nurse offering her breast. Um, his teacher is signing this, uh, there to help, and a woman preparing a, a bath for him. Notice again that there's a panther here directly at his feet. There were also panthers here uh, at the feet of, uh, of Ariadne as well. Uh, they are regularly associated with, with Bacchus. Um, and uh, in this case, the focus on his birth was chosen for this particular sarcophagus because this was a child's sarcophagus. Um, it's in fact quite a bit smaller than the other ones in the room. And so an infant's death and, you know, afterlife is symbolized by the, the birth of, of Dionysus. The rest of the sarcophagus is covered by images of his drunken entourage again. <clears throat> Here's a drunken old man uh, being supported by two figures carried away, I guess, uh, you know, by, uh, after having had a few too many. And on the far right, uh, we can see one of these dancing savior figures with this horrific face as he's giving himself over the strong drink. One last sarcophagus from the Walters Art Museum where we see Bacchus one last time. Uh, here he's riding a chariot uh, on the left. And in fact, if you look at that closely, there's Bacchus now attended by his figures and his chariot is being pulled by panthers uh, as they are led forward. The reason for associating Bacchus with panthers has to do with Greek expansion and colonization. Uh, in the late 4th century, Alexander the Great of Greece had colonized part of India. And as the Greeks colonized India, they adopted many of their customs and translated them into Greek mythology. And so uh, the panther was adopted from Shiva, who was usually accompanied by a tiger. And what the Greeks did was made the character uh, the consort of, of, of Dionysus. And of course, the Romans, changing Dionysus into Bacchus, simply adopted the same practice. And uh, once Greece annexed parts of India, we began to see even Greek images showing the triumph of Dionysus marching into India, and the Romans have again uh, taken that over lock, stock, and barrel. And when we see it on a sarcophagus, it's intended to be uh, a triumph over death, a triumphal march into a new territory. If you look behind uh, Bacchus, you'll notice there's a winged figure placing a wreath on his head. Uh, in one of the other 
part sixes, we saw a very similar figure, either carving uh, shields on the column of Trajan or placing a similar wreath on the head of the Emperor Titus uh, in his triumphal arm. Uh, directly in front of him is a satyr who is leading uh, the dragons forward as they march to the right. Notice um, all of the realistic exotic animals. This elephant, for example, that appears here is one of many elephants uh, that appear on this sarcophagus. Another old drunken man in front of yet another panther uh, moving forward as uh, dancers, uh, musicians, uh, sing them onward with this tambourine. Uh, again, two more of these really well detailed and accurately depicted um, elephants. And then finally, uh, a bit further, we can see uh, more of these figures here as we move our way forward. And then off to the far right, uh, we see lions and serpents, a uh, bird in the tree, more satyr figures, all of August, uh, excuse me, of Bacchus's uh, entourage uh, dancing with him in, in this triumphal march into India, which is seen as an allegory for uh, triumph over death. Now, not every sarcophagus showed mythological scenes related to rebirth, and not every mythological scene was Bacchus, and you happen to see three of them. Battle sarcophagi were very common in the 2nd and 3rd century A.D., during a period when Rome was, in fact, significantly more violent, and that life had turned more violent, more emperors overthrowing uh, their predecessor rather than inheriting this world peacefully. Here we see a sarcophagus for a young general, and he's depicted uh, on the front of the sarcophagus. His face has been retouched, so we're not 100% sure who he is. Uh, riding on horseback over an incredibly chaotic battle. Uh, this is meant to commemorate, we're sure, uh, one of the major victories of this young general's life. But at the same time, just like the triumph of Bacchus, it's meant to show uh, his triumph um, over death itself, his victory over death itself. And even though the face has been retouched somewhat, you'll notice that even with the posture, he has a somewhat calm, demeanor amid this particularly chaotic battle. More Romans uh, accompany him and help him with the battle. They're all dressed in military garb. Um, they're killing a number of barbarians. Uh, note that the barbarians here are, in fact, all bearded. This is more or less the norm. There are a few times that we see it violated as a rule. But here our clean-shaven Romans are distinguished from our bearded barbarians uh, that they are in fact defeated uh, and eventually lay uh, on the ground beneath uh, the combined forces of Rome. Um, it's exceptionally well carved, um, and many think that it might have been done for the son of a third century emperor, one who was known to have died in battle. But you can see these incredible details, the kneeling force, uh, the chain mail of this figure here, the trumpets uh, that uh, lead the Romans into war. And again, uh, our barbarians in trousers, uh, which is something that we saw also on the, on the column of Trajan. And just as a sense of how well carved and how deeply carved it is, you can see uh, here in this raking view uh, the exceptional level of, of expertise in, in this 